Hey, 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 Math Moment Makers, do we have a special podcast episode queued up for you today? That's right, Kyle. We are really excited to share the audio replay of a webinar we hosted recently titled Four Strategies to Help Students Start Math Problems and Stick with them. Yes, just a few weeks back, we hosted our first ever webinar weekend where over 800 educators joined us for learning from the comfort of their own couch. The buzz in the chat area was dynamite, and the response was fantastic. We are so excited to share the audio from the webinar with you. But keep in mind while listening that this was a live webinar where participants could see us on the screen as well as our slides. In this recording, you'll hear us reference those slides and other resources you can download. If you want to see those slides, you can get the full experience in HD, vivid color, fully animated, and with all the oh so visual appeal by going to makemathmoments.com forward slash webinar. That is makemathmoments.com forward slash webinar. Well, let's not waste any more time. Click the sleep button on your phone and drop it into your pocket. It's time to make math moments. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are two math teachers who together with you, the community of educators worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark engagement, fuel learning, and ignite teacher action. Are you ready for episode number 19, John? I am, I am. Welcome to episode 19 on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. Four strategies to help students start math problems and stick with them. Before we get to the webinar audio replay, one of our favorite books that John and I have read recently was by author James Clear. The book is called Atomic Habits, Tiny Changes, Remarkable Results. It blew our minds how we can make small changes in our personal lives and even in our teaching lives that can have a huge impact on being successful. And believe it or not, both John and I both actually listened to this book in audio format while driving, running, or just relaxing. Now you can too, for free, because Amazon's Audible platform is offering two free books by going to makemathmoments.com forward slash free book. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash free book. If you like podcasts, then two free audiobooks with Audible is the way to go. And now on to the webinar replay. Why we're here. If you have a look at this animated GIF, I don't know how well it's showing up on your screen because this is a webinar, so some of the tech might give us a little bit of a, an issue. But I think we've all felt like this little boy after a lesson before in math class. So we've spent a significant amount of time planning your lesson. Things are moving along just as you thought they would, but then you come to the end of the lesson and then all of a sudden you ask students to try something on their own. And what do you know? The same group of students get started while the others just sit there and wait. We know that we've been there before and I'm gonna guess that you've been there before too. So what we wanna do tonight is we wanna explore four strategies to help those students get started, but then also make sure that they can stick with them. So let's talk about what we'll get tonight or what we'll get out of this webinar. You got it. So a couple of big things that we want you to get out of this and kind of things that are going to keep us honest is we want to help you help your students build confidence and resilience so that they'll develop a productive disposition towards mathematics. That's one of the big things that we want you to take away here. Another one is how to ensure students are building a conceptual understanding in order to build that procedural fluency, kind of that holy grail we're all after over time. And we want to set up and how to structure our lessons so that students will dive right into problems and that problem solving process without relying on you every step of the way. That's a big one for me right now is that all these kids are shooting their hands up and how can we get them to be more confident with each other and themselves so that they can start the problem solving process without waiting for every step-by-step -step set of instructions that we can give them. Awesome. And then once they get on their way, giving 
teacher moves necessary in order to promote student thinking and independence. So letting that stick to itiveness is what we're after here. You got it. You know, you might be wondering if we can deliver on this promise. And we actually had an email from one of you this last week who has been struggling with these things too and wonders if it's even possible that we can say make do on these promises because you know we said that we can get all of our kids engaged in the problem solving process and this teacher was saying I'm really like you can see that he capitalized all and start problem solving because they're saying he's never had a full year where everybody was doing it all the time and, and we're not saying that every kid is all of a sudden going to be a level four or an A plus student. What we're saying is that we can create more confident problem solving students in your room and all, we are saying all, your students will be able to get into problem solving and avoid quitting early. Awesome, and that's exactly what we had said. And you know, we wanna make sure that we clear up right away that we're never doing it wrong. We do the best that we have with the tools we have in our tool belt. And one thing we do wanna make sure that there's no miscommunication here. When we look at how we learn, if we pretend that these dots are students in our room, it would be great to think that all the students were at the exact same place and that we were taking them from what they currently know and moving them along to this new knowledge or this new understanding. But in reality, we all know that students are in very different places and not even in a straight line. They're not learning along the same exact path. There is variation there. So their learning journey looks a little bit more like this. So it's likely that when you look at students in your room, they're going to be looking a little bit more like these dots here all over. And I believe, if I recall, I think we only have 10 dots there. And I don't know the last time <laughs> I taught a class with 10 students. So right. I'm thinking it's an awful lot more messy than what we see up on the screen. So 20 plus for sure. Exactly. So we are not saying that tonight you're going to walk out of here and every student's going to be at the same place at the end of a lesson. But what we are saying is that if we use these strategies, we can help bump each and every one of those students just a little bit further down their own path towards mathematical success. And I think that is a very valuable thing if we can move those students along those paths, keeping in mind, making that learning valid for those students. So let's talk a little bit about who we are. I guess I'll introduce myself as maybe odd as that might be. I'm a K through 12 math consultant. I have a friend from Bagley out there I saw in the chat box, which is awesome. We did a lunch and learn not too long ago, and I'm actually coming to your neck of the woods of Greater Essex County District School Board in the next couple weeks. So I am a consultant with Greater Essex. I also have some other things that I've done along the way. I've done the Apple Distinguished Educator Program, tons of great learning. Google Certified Innovator at the time it was Educator, and I love my experience there. We've done some workshops and keynotes, but really I like to think of myself as a fueler of sense making. That's like kind of what I'm really focused on lately. Some of you may have come across some of the resources that I've created and co-created with John here. John, who's John Orr here? Tell him a little <laughs> bit about yourself. Thank you, Cal. I'm John Orr. I'm a high school math teacher in the Lambton Kent District School Board, and I teach in Chatham, Ontario at John McGregor Secondary School. Chatham's just down the road from Windsor. Kyle and I can get together quite often because we only live about 15-minute drive between our houses, even though we teach in different districts. You know, I guess you could say that I consider myself lately a specialist at teaching grade nine applied level math here in Ontario. And, you know, for those of you who aren't sure what that is, it's a class that focuses on teaching students, you know, linear relations and measurement and rates and ratios and how we can apply them to real world scenarios. Although it's a ninth grade course, the content has many grade five through eight topics embedded inside. And so I, I almost feel like sometimes teaching that class, we're really teaching some elementary, or we are teaching elementary concepts. And so I, I almost feel like I could go back and I would actually would love to go back and teach at the lower levels for sure. Like Kyle, I've done the Apple Distinguished Educator Program. I'm a, a Desmos Fellow, which is an online graphing tool. We travel North America this last year. We've been really busy with workshops and keynote speaking. Like Kyle, I consider myself a curiosity instigator. One of my favorite things to do is to think about how I can create these problems in my class more curious than, say, what I did when I, at the beginning of my career. And so 
that's my hobby. Awesome. Tell them a little bit about uh, some of the resources people might have run into along the way. Yeah, you might have visited some of my websites where I write about math education, say over on mr geekcom or on mathbeforebed.com where I try to provide resources and prompts for changing how teachers, parents, and students talk about elementary math. That's been a big passion project for me this last two to three years. So I'm pretty uh, pumped about the work going on there. Yeah, we actually have spent a lot of time in elementary and myself in particular with my new role as a K through 12 consultant. You know, so John and I have really, really fallen in love with the K through eight experience. And it's really informed our instruction across from K all the way through 12. And then most recently, we've launched the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. So if you haven't checked that out, check it out on iTunes. It's also on every other platform, Google Play and so on. That we are on episode eight, I believe. And mm-hmm. next week we have episode nine coming out and then some great guests, including Joe Bowler. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just recorded her last night. Just actually. last night so, we chatted with Joe and we're pretty excited for that episode to come out. So what we want to do is basically try to help you folks learn a little bit through a lot of, we're going to call them a lot of our missteps. I never want to say mistake because again, it's everything is learning, but we spent a lot of time in our classroom trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. We were really inspired to start doing things like three act math tasks. When we saw Dan Meyer speak using open questions, when John encountered Marion Small early in his career, but we really struggled along the way. And it's only been these last few years that we've really started to try to put together some sort of framework. So we're gonna talk about that today and really just try to help you not only spark curiosity, but fuel sense making in our yeah. You know, we've been fortunate enough for the last couple of years to present for many great organizations and for many districts across North America. And we want to begin our talk tonight with something that we've been passionate about this last couple of years, which is the idea of moments in classrooms. And why is that important? Moments are, you know, they're important because they make a difference. And we've been talking about moments, like how can moments be captured for our math classes? And we wanted to kind of dive into this book that we stumbled across last year by Chip and Dan Heath. And in their book, they share kind of like how we can capture moments and capitalize on them and how we can create moments because moments stick with us. Moments, they're things that we remember. And that's something that we're trying to do in our math classes for sure. And we want to share a story that we pulled from this book that I think you'll find quite a good example of why moments matter. And in their book, they share a story about a certain hotel in Los Angeles. You know, it's a story about the top rated hotel on TripAdvisor by reviews back in the fall of 2017. Now, why we're saying it's fall of 2017, one is because today it's not the number one hotel, it's just a few numbers down, but we thought the story would be better if we went back to the 2017 year and said it's number one. But can you guess what this hotel is? We're gonna give you 30 seconds to make some guesses in the chat box. Like what hotel in Los Angeles would be the number one reviewed, ranked hotel in all of Los Angeles out of 432 hotels? Go ahead, throw a couple in the chat box. Remember, put them in the chat box, not the Q&A. And make sure that your two line in the chat at the very bottom, it says all panelists and attendees. That makes sure everyone can see it. Go ahead. Awesome. The Hilton, the Ritz, any other guesses? Oh, Hilton, yeah, Ritz, International, Four Seasons, Hampton Inn. People went for the Hampton Inn thinking maybe it might have snuck in. Trump Hotel, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Beverly Hills. These are pretty good guesses. Pretty yeah. good. These are things that I was thinking for sure. The, the residents. residents and I was thinking the Four Seasons when I first it, thought about this. If you're from Essex County, if I say the Green Acres Motel, does that spark any the White Oaks and, uh, <laughs> in Wallsburg? But yeah. uh, now we're... Uh, uh, awesome. Great Beverly. guesses. Awesome guesses here. And here's our reveal. So here we go. This is the number one ranked by reviews hotel in all of Los Angeles in 2017. And today it's only number five. But it's called the Magic Castle Hotel. Sounds inspiring. Uh, yeah, I know. We know that like no one guessed this, and we didn't think that anyway would. And when I was presented with this problem, we definitely didn't guess this. And you know, when you think of the Magic Castle Hotel, this is not like the top ranked hotel. This is not the Bel Air or the Kimpton La Pierre or the Four Seasons. And actually, when you take some look at the pictures on TripAdvisor, it really looks like it's a motel, and that's kind of what it is. It's really a motel, and you never guessed that it was the top hotel. It actually looks like a three star ish or less kind of motel. And you know what makes this the top ranked hotel by reviews is the hotel's ability 
to create lasting moments and memories. Like on check-in, you get a care package that has a ton of goodies in it, like candy bars and niceties. It's like you get in, you weren't expecting this for sure. They have an ice cream machine and anyone at any time can go in and have some soft serve. How much does it cost, John, for the ice cream? And it's free. All free. All free. Wow. You know, and then the most memorable thing that people write about this hotel mm -hmm. is the Popsicle hotline. Like out by the pool is this red phone and it says Popsicle hotline. You're seeing the picture on the screen. And when you pick it up, someone on the other end of the line says Popsicle hotline. We'll be right out. And someone with white gloves comes out with this fancy tray with an assortment of popsicles for you to choose from. Like, no, you wouldn't expect this at this hotel for sure. And it's because, like, that's why this is the top reviewed hotel. It's like people walk away from this hotel with the lasting positive memories about their experience. We're just going to pause here for a sec. Yeah, look at that. People would agree. Impressive service. Mm -hmm. It looks like a few people are actually intending to go there now. This is a uh, quite the hotel. We have not been there yet, but mm -hmm. when we head to California, we're definitely going to be trying to look this thing mm -hmm. up. So what we want to talk a little bit about is how we can leverage the power of moments in math class. And really, that's kind of what John and I have been working on is this idea of like making math moments that matter. And we truly believe through our own experiences, like for a while we thought it was luck, but we now realize that no, there's certain things we can do to make memorable math moments with our students. They can be created, it isn't luck. So what we wanna do is just briefly share with you our three-part framework, which some of you may have seen, maybe you've taken our four-part video series, which is up at makemathmoments.com forward slash lesson one. Others may have seen it in other places, but what we want to do is actually talk about four very specific strategies that fit nicely right inside this framework. So we're going to get going with our first strategy today, and that first strategy is avoiding the rush to the algorithm. And this is something for those who have attended any of the work John and I have done, whether it's at OAME or if it was NCTM or anything like that along the way, we really push this idea that we rush often too quickly to the algorithm. We're not saying algorithms are bad, but we have to make sure students are ready for that. And we know that rushing to the algorithm will not create resilient problem solvers. It'll actually do the opposite. It'll actually make kids not want to get started and have them push the mathematics away. So what we mean is, and one of the action items around not rushing to the algorithm is we want to say we need to stop pre-teaching and start, you know, listening to our students, creating a productive struggle. These are the things that we want to do instead of doing the pre-teaching, the front loaning. And when you think about math class, there's this formulaic math class with this ritual of taking up homework giving out examples, assigning the homework. And if we want to create problem solvers who are ready to dive into problem solving, like first, like that's what we talked about we're here for, is that we're going to start them to solve problems. Like this is not the way to do it. And we need to teach through problem solving. Like if you look at this, this is a lesson plan template from the first few years that I was a teacher. And it always started with examples and definitions. And that's pretty much all it was. And we always started with that note and it ended with me showing how to solve word problems. Like when we got to the word problems at the end of the template of the lesson, I just showed them how to do it anyway. Like I walked through them step by step. I was, I was walking them through how to solve problems. Is that really problem solving, Kyle? No, absolutely. And then the other thing that I tend to do, and I know, John, you've done things like this, but then I started thinking like, oh, okay, my kids can't solve problems. So I bet you it's just because they're disorganized. And I would agree, we want students to be organized in math class, but you know, I would hand them a highlighter and say, okay, now go highlight all the keywords or mm -hmm. go highlight mm -hmm. all the numbers. And again, not suggesting that that can't be any part of a math class, but that will not create the resilient problem solvers that we're after. We also have this idea that maybe like a problem solving model might do the trick. And again, those problem solving models, while at times can be helpful for organizing, 
the model itself doesn't help students with the resiliency or even their willingness to necessarily start the problem. And one thing that, that I did for a long time is I would create anchor charts for certain things. And, you know, again, we're not saying that anchor charts aren't useful, but it's how they're constructed. And if you can co-construct anchor charts with your students after the fact, like after the exploration is done, then that might be useful. But just giving, like I used to have a page that I would save year to year on the steps to solve problems, like you can see on the right side of the picture there, but math strategies like circle the key numbers, that's where the highlighters come in, underline question. These were things that, you know, you just put up on the wall and say, this is what we're going to refer to. To me, this is not problem solving. This is coming from this idea that we are planning our lessons. Now, this quote is coming from Peter Little at all, a, a math professor of education at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. But you know, he would say, we plan our lessons, and we have been planning our lessons, under the assumption that kids can't or won't think. And, you know, I did that for a long time. And if we want great problem solvers, just teaching them how to solve problems with the step-by-step -step procedures, you're just still walking them through the step-by-step -step procedures. We are not getting them to solve problems. Like, how do you get kids to solve problems? You put them in situations that are unfamiliar to them, and then you give them feedback and support along the way so that they can feel successes. So that's why we say stop pre-teaching all the rules necessary and start exploring because then you can pull all the stuff together, and then you can listen to what they have to say, and you're allowing them to do the thinking, right? And so, John, like, I'm sitting here hearing what you're saying, and I'm just wondering, like, I remember hearing this message and going, okay, I'm going to do that, and you and I both tried to do this for a while. So tell us, like, a little bit about your first task that you ever tried. You know, maybe some of you did this problem, but when I first did three-act math tasks, I was like, this is the savior of all things, and... I would get my students to watch the videos and I would say, you know, what is the math problem that we would want kids to solve here? Which is one of my first kind of critical mistakes, in my opinion, to say like, what's the math problem here? Because it's hard for students to think about math. Like they have a hard time solving the word problems, let alone coming up with them. So all I did was when they kind of were trying to think about this math problem, I ended up just showing them how to do it anyway. And I thought, you know, this is great because it's a video. And then I still just did step-by-step -step procedures to solve this problem. All right, so what we wanna do here is just give a couple quick examples. Again, not gonna to spend too much time going through the actual mathematics, and we're looking at time. John just pointed to the clock and, and <laughs> basically made a look at me like, get moving, so here we go. I wanna share with you a problem that, uh, kind of a typical problem. We're not, again, not downplaying that we never do word problems. Word problems are important, but I think there's a process of how we wanna introduce students to new ideas and work them towards word problems. So here we have a typical area problem. And basically what we're kind of saying is, all right, like instead of us pre-teaching this idea of area or even just like telling students what area is, what if we were to just give them some opportunities to explore? So here's something from my site, Math is Visual. Like if we were just to ask students like, how many of these will it take to cover that? And even before that, giving them an opportunity to notice and wonder. You know, what do they notice and wonder about the orange, what appears to be a square and the blue rectangle? And really, they usually come up with something along these lines. And then we want to give them an opportunity to make an estimate. You know, you want to definitely give them time to have a chat with their neighbor, work things out, and then let them actually explore it. Like give them the actual tiles to cover this thing up and then allowing them to see the reveal, the big reveal, like let them update their estimate along the way. So here I give you a row. Maybe I then give you a little more time to talk with your neighbors. And then maybe I just start it's like breadcrumbs, just slowly giving them more and more information. Like here I'm giving you uh, one full column. And at this point, some students intuitively start to see the rows and columns, right? And some will not. That's where our explicit instruction is going to come in eventually. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we could take something that seems pretty bland and make it accessible for all students in my class, even those students who are still stuck counting one-to-one. -one, or maybe skip counting. So as you can see here, we can access this through skip counting first and then make some connections to multiplication. So that is our strategy number one. And we wanna make sure that we are stop pre-teaching, give students an opportunity to create productive struggle and start listening and observing. 
And at the end, we have a download link. We've got a collection of all the resources, uh, the links to the tasks that we're sharing and a couple more resources here, like a takeaway on how to avoid rushing to the algorithm, some more steps involved than we can go in through for the short time. We're going to share that link to download these resources at the end. So stay tuned for that. But right now, this is a time for our action item on strategy number one. We just want you to pause for a moment and think about some of the lessons that you've taught or are recently be teaching and which lesson can you avoid some pre-teaching coming up and instead teach through the task, teach through problem solving. You might be sitting there wondering, okay, so it's great to avoid pre-teaching. Like it's great to say, oh, don't do this and do that instead. Mm -hmm. But the big question is how. So that's what's going to bring up strategy number two. Which we're calling strategy number two is if you've got your workbook ready, you're ready to write this down. We left you some blanks, but this is give your students an all access pass. And what we mean by that is to create tasks in your class that are low floor and high ceiling. And that is one of our kind of biggest go-tos is how can we get kids to start problems and stick with them? How we can get them to start problems is to get them into these low floor, high ceiling tasks. That's how we can teach through tasks and get our kids into them as quickly as we can and keep them there in that task so that they have less chance of giving up later on. But keeping that low floor is very important. Awesome. And, and what we saw in that first strategy, the example we gave with area, if we look at this example here, again, another word problem, we need kids to eventually learn how to solve word problems, but if they're not starting, that's not very helpful at all. So something we can do to lower the floor is make it visual and try to spark some curiosity. And while John and I tend to use video quite a bit for this, that's not the only way. There's tons of ways we can spark curiosity. Here's just one example. This happens to be a jar, what appears to be of gummy worms. And we would give students this opportunity, again, to notice and wonder and actually make those predictions and then see what the solution is to that problem. So really the technique that we're trying to pitch to you here is to make things visual and ask this question which is noticing and wondering. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the uh, actually four techniques that we're going to give you here to lower the floor and create high ceiling tasks. And what we're calling these four things is we came up with a name about a year ago that we thought, you know, sounded really nice. So that we stuck with it, but we call these things the curiosity path. And, and if we follow the curiosity path, not only can we get kids to solve problems quicker and get them into it, but we keep them in there longer. And so noticing and wonder is a big thing from us on how, how to start that process. So kids can actually anticipate what's actually happening here. So for example, if we look at this particular problem, this is called the fraction fill problem. And you know, again, pretty basic at its core, but if we were to just change this thing up just slightly, and I think this task actually comes from your Math yeah. Before Bed website, there, right. John, he had a bit of a frog in his Yeah, I did. I had to cough. And so now on this particular task, what we're doing is we're going to make this a little bit more curious to solve this problem. But in a moment, you're going to see the screen start to fill up. And what I have my students do is yell out the word now when the blue rectangles cover exactly half the screen. So it's like they're going to trickle in and they're thinking about how many are going to be needed to cover half the screen. This is a great entryway and to start talking about, you know, it could be fractions or area, but we definitely lower the floor here. And one of the next kind of technique that we're aiming at here is called anticipation. If we can spark their curiosity by lowering the floor and getting them to notice and wonder, that generates, and if we can do this right, we can generate anticipation in our students. And we think that is a huge piece to help solve problems. If, like, if students can start anticipating where this is going or anticipating what they need to solve a problem, that's half the problem solving battle. It's if they can come up with what they need, then it's like they don't need to read all that stuff. They know what they're yeah. looking for. And you can't do that by giving them everything up front. We have to lower that floor. Yeah, and it really comes down to this idea of students like living the context, right? So now students are like, they're seeing it, they're experiencing it, 
And you know that they're going to have these discussions with their students to make things more memorable. So we're going to continue down this path because really in order to build that anticipation so that a notice and wonder is worthwhile, we need to start looking at problems and we need to think about something like, so here's another problem here, traditional problem, like we've tried all these tricks, right? Like we're going to change the name and the problem and put in like a student in the class. Put Toby's name in. Yeah, Toby. Oh, we'll change go. it. We'll change it to, uh, oh, we'll change it to my name. We'll put my name in the problem because kids will want to solve this so problem So much better. more interesting. You know, maybe not a flower bed. That's not really cool. Like maybe a pig pen. Wait a second. Boy, pig pen, that's pig, weird. That's weird. No, but cell phones are cool. So that could work. I'm not sure. But really what's missing when we do this and, you know, still have fun and do all of these things for fun, but it's not going to address the issues that we've mentioned earlier tonight. Really what we need to do to change this problem and to really make for a successful notice and wonder to lower the floor on this task or these tasks is to withhold information. So if I'm withholding information, this task is going to look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And what we can do is we can strip some stuff away by taking all that stuff out and presenting this kind of mysterious problem where they don't have any information to start with. You know, Dan Meyer has a great phrase that you can always add, but you can't subtract. And which means as when you give them all the information up front in solving problems, you can't ever take that away again. They know it. But if you slowly give them the information or better yet, ask them to give you that information that's that anticipation piece then you can give them one increment at a time and, and this problem generates a lot of notice and wonder what's going on but it's gonna get the question out and then we can say you know what well how many sticks are there what's that next kind of problem going forward and basically what we're trying to say here is that without this withholding of information your notice and wonder is not going to really yield that successful mathematical discourse or discussion with your students. So those three pieces, building up that anticipation through the withholding of information and then allowing students to notice and wonder leads things so nicely towards the fourth piece of our curiosity path, which is estimation. So again, just in summary, when we look at these ideas, what we're sharing with you we shared the notice and wonder first, so it might appear as though maybe it looks kind of like this. You go from notice and wonder, then worry about anticipation, then worry about withholding information. But in reality, what we're doing is we're actually starting by withholding information to head down that path. And once that path is etched out for students, it puts us in such a beautiful place to actually ask for meaningful predictions and estimates. So some of you out there, I have to just assume that if you're in the room right now, you're the type of teacher who's probably run into Andrew Stiddell's Estimation 180. And really, in order to do any form of estimating, you need to withhold that information. So for us, this pathway has been something huge for us in order to lower the floor on tasks. And we are going to give you just a moment here to complete your workbook that you've printed off in order to fill in your curiosity path so that we can work towards making memorable moments instead of rushing to algorithms. So if you're filling in your workbook, if you printed off your workbook, even if you didn't print off your workbook, no big worries. We're going to send you another copy of that workbook anyway, so you can share that with any other teachers you like. But again, we got some more resources going forward you can get at the end of the presentation. We've got a handout that you can use, which is summarizes the four parts of the curiosity path, which again, helps us lower the floor to get kids in the solving problems so that they can start them. And that's one of the things that can help build that kind of problem solving is how can we get them in and keep them in there. One of the other things we're including here, we didn't have time to go over uh, today, which is what we call our curiosity path template, which helps you plan lessons to remind you about how those four stages of the curiosity path. And it's mostly a blank form for you to kind of brainstorm and plan out a lesson going forward. So we'll be sending that to you by the end of this workshop for sure. Make sure you stick around after the question and answer period. So that brings us to the next action item on your part. We just outlined as you know, very quickly, we are speaking Absolutely. so quickly tonight, the four different ways you can spark curiosity, which again helps lower that floor. Yeah. So we're going to be giving you another thing to think about here. I noticed also in the chat, some folks are saying, ah, darn, we forgot to print the workbook. There is still time. Use that air print or whatever you're using to start printing that thing off. But that workbook is there. It is in the emails, the last mm -hmm. few emails that mm -hmm. were sent out. So feel free to take a moment to grab that. But right now, before you do, 
we want you to think about that upcoming lesson. How can you use the curiosity path to lower the floor and raise the ceiling? So think ahead. We're not saying throw out your entire curriculum or your entire you know, lesson plans for the long range planning that you've already done. How do you take the task that you intended to do this week? Maybe it's Tuesday, maybe it's Wednesday. Who knows what day you wanna pick, pick one. And then we want you to share in the chat box how you could use the curiosity path. What would you do in order to help lower that floor? And Let's dive into strategy number three, which is, it. yes, be more prints. And now you're sitting there scratching your head what? and you're going, what the heck are these two monkeys talking about? What are they doing over there? We are not talking about these kinds of princes. Even though they're good looking. They are. Hey, I'm actually, I feel like my hairline looks more like the gentleman on the left than on the right, but that's okay. We'll talk about that another time. I'm talking about this prince right here. And you're thinking to yourself, how the heck is this going to tie into math? We're going to get to that in just a couple minutes. But before we do, before I make that tie in, I want to talk to you a little bit about tools and representations because our strategy number three ties into this idea of tools and representations and I'm going to help show you how tools and representations can connect to prints, the artist prints, not the royalty princes that we shared with you. So if we want kids to stick with problems once they've started, so we've used the curiosity path like we shared in the last strategy, and we've also talked about that lowering of the floor and raising of the ceiling on tasks. We need to keep students on the task. It's great if they're interested in engaging in the notice and wonder, maybe even throwing a prediction out there. But then all of a sudden, once we do reveal some of the information, we give them some quantities to work with, and then they go to solve the problem, they end up giving up. They throw their hands up and they say, I don't get it or they wait for somebody else mm -hmm. to show them. So what we're doing here is we want to talk about tools and representations because really we need tools not just for thinking. This is what a lot of people get stuck on when they think about manipulatives is, hey, I'm using manipulatives so students, that means that they don't have a good deep mathematical understanding, but we're going to say that's a myth. That is not true because we also need to use tools to represent our thinking. So. We're going to make intentional use of tools, and in particular, what kind of tools? Yeah, so the kind of tools we're talking about are tools that are very particular in making model tools, like what we call, but also what Alex Lawson calls, is mathematical models with legs. You know, they go more places than just having one particular purpose and then so thinking about like these tools that we can use to represent and solve problems with these are tools with legs they're more than just say counters they're very powerful tools the other thing it's like they extend across grades kathy you know? fosno who we also just talked to on our podcast and that's an upcoming episode called them power tools like tools that again similar idea that tools like the area model mm -hmm. uh, can be used for many different things and stretches across grade levels that's where the legs i think comes from and stretch vertically, not horizontally, when we're talking about progressions, say grade levels. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so we're talking about these tools and representations. And, you know, I might start with maybe this problem here. And, and you might be thinking to yourself, eh, if I'm in a younger grade, maybe this might be a little bit too much. But after a notice and wonder, oftentimes students will come up with like, how many donuts are in this big giant box? Well, I'm going to go and roll all the way back here into a younger grade level because, you know what, for some students, they might need to be in this land right here and they might have to do a notice and wonder on mm -hmm. a regular size box of donuts, right? Mm -hmm. So giving them this opportunity again, withholding information, following the curiosity path, it's all great. But in reality, in order for students to solve these problems, we need them to be able to not only use their spatial reasoning, but start using tools and representations to help them use tools for thinking as well as tools for representing. So you might have some students in your class that know right away there's 12 there because I know three times four is 12. But even so, we want to make sure students understand what would be a good representation to model what three groups of 12 looks like. And if they're creating groups and piles, we want to help move them towards this idea of organization and rows and columns like the array, which is a great place to lead us towards that area model. 
something else we want to address with tools and representations is just this idea of abstraction. We often forget, and I mean, how could we not? It's been so long since we were young children. We don't recall what it was like learning at this stage, but students need to work from the tangible, from the concrete, and make their way through to the visual stages before they can get to the abstract. So that means working with actual donuts. Those might be the tools mm -hmm. to work with if it's a kindergarten class, and then maybe working towards manipulatives. Because guess what? If I use square tiles, that doesn't look like a donut, silly. No. That's just too abstract for me to handle. But over time, and through repeated use, we can work our way to visual representations, and then on to abstract representations. And even though some of you are looking at this thinking three and then the words groups of four, that doesn't seem very abstract, but think of it from a young child's perspective. They need to understand what multiplication is at its core before they work their way to numbers, operations, and mm -hmm. symbols. And I think, Kyle, that's where we've, especially me in the past, have failed, especially high school teachers. And I know that we're talking with elementary school teachers, but I think some of them can relate, is that we jump to the abstract representation way too often. Mm -hmm. We think that they're just going to pick up on that, and we call that number sense. But we need to go back to this concrete and then visual and then work our way towards abstract. It's a progression. And then, mm -hmm. like, tie it back to the very first couple slides we had, think of those dots moving along those curves. Not everybody's ready for the abstract at the exact same time. Absolutely. And that's where having these tools and representations always readily available and not just available because it was years that I actually just kept the tools there and I said, they're there if you need them. And then right. students felt like they were doing the walk of shame to go get yeah. it. So I have to be intentional about grabbing those tools and actually working mm -hmm. with them. All right, so we are going to skip ahead here. We had all kinds of representations Ooh, to share so with you, but we will share some links as we promised at the end, which will model some of these representations. So now what I want to do with you folks is I want to make an explicit connection. Hmm. Let's go back, back to Prince. To our buddy, our buddy boy here, Mr. Prince. So how the heck can I be more Prince in my math class? And really the point we want to make with you here today is that Prince understood the concreteness fading model. That model we just looked at, moving from concrete towards abstraction. He got it. He knew it. Like he knew that he had to be out there for so long building his fan base in the flesh, in concrete form, before he could start moving towards visual representations, whether that be pushing posters. MTV. MTV even, <laughs> right? I'm not on MTV until I've actually, people have experienced my live shows in the flesh. And then and only then, once we've built up this fan base to see me in the flesh, they know what I'm all about. They start collecting and putting posters on their walls, watching me on TV and listening to my music on their own time. Can you possibly ever consider introducing a symbol like we do in math class way too fast. So if we go all the way back to that first strategy, thinking about rushing to the algorithm, rushing to the algorithm, we always rush to abstraction as well. So our strategy number three to help students stick with your problems is to bring those tools and representations into the classroom, just like Prince would have done, and be more Prince. So if this is the case, if we're asking you to be more Prince, we've got to once again think about where to begin. How are we going to begin this journey together? And we're going to have you do a little bit of thinking here because we know that there's a lot to know and understand when it comes to making and using mathematical models. So we want to give you not only an opportunity to do some thinking and sharing, but also to give you a chance to win our next prize. John, can you explain the action item in detail? Sure. So what we want you to do in the chat box, again, is... Talk about a mathematical model, maybe a mathematical model with legs or a power tool that you have used in the past, or even maybe pose a question or a struggle or a challenge that you have about them. Like maybe you don't have a lot of experience with those and you just want to throw something in there. Maybe someone can answer that. Our fourth and final strategy is be the guide, not the hero. And to talk about this, I want to think about that that you're the guide in the classroom. And I think if you take that approach that you're not the hero in the classroom, and I think I taught it like I was the hero for a lot of the times that, you know, I was the center 
I made sure that I controlled everything in the classroom. Whereas if you take the approach that your student is the hero and you are the guide, we can definitely bring these other three strategies online in your classrooms. And let me explain just for a moment how this relates to you know, actual heroes, is if you think about all these stories and movies and books that they all have a very similar path, which is actually called the hero's journey. And what the hero's journey looks like for all those books is in every story that begins the same way that, you know, the hero and you are introduced to a world and that world starts to change and the hero has to go on a path, a journey, and they have to battle the forces of evil to overcome the obstacle in, in the story. And they have to go through crisis and it's the struggle and the crisis that they learn about themselves and who they are and, and what tools they have and, and how they can solve the problem. And, you know, the, that's where the guide shows up is during the crisis and the struggle. They're on that part there. And the hero couldn't get to the climax of the story. And it wouldn't be amazing if the hero did not go through the struggle and the crisis. They had to go through that so that it felt worth it for them. And it also felt worth it for the audience watching the story. And what I love about this is this is not just a hero. This is the path that we go through every time we learn something. In order for us to attach significant value to our learning, we have to go through this process. If we don't go through this process, it probably wasn't that valuable to us. And it's because of that crisis and the struggle that we go through that we get to attach value to our learning. And we all need that kind of guide to get us to that spot. And sometimes we can get there on our own, but that guide definitely can guide that way. And when we think about math class on that same kind of tension time graph, uh, that traditional math class that I'm talking about, you know, a lot of the cases is this is a high school math class that I always remember, and you probably remember too, but that four kind of standard class where you do these four things, if you put that on this time scale, that tension rises really quickly. And that's because, you know, you're starting your lesson, you're tell, 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 you're telling the students how to do everything. And then they do get to this point where the tension drops. And that's because they've probably followed the instructions enough and copied enough and memorized enough for some of them. And then that tension goes away because all the textbook questions that the teacher assigned look like the examples. And it looks like, so there's actually no thinking going on. And therefore, if you were a great follower of, in memorization techniques, you didn't have that much of a problem in class. And some of those kids are on that path there and they're probably stuck at the top. And what's happening there is we're rushing to the algorithm during all of those stages uh, or that, sorry, that stage. We're rushing to the algorithm that whole time. And what we really want to do in our classes is take this model, which, you know, what it looks like in that traditional way, we want to flip it to this other model, this hero's journey. We want our kids to be on this journey. And what's happening during this part is like the hero has to kind of that world starts to change is we've got to create that. That's the getting kids curious with the low floor, high ceiling. We create this productive struggle for our students, which is teaching through task. And this allows us for listening to our students, understanding what they know before that we need to kind of fill in any gaps. You know, what happens is as you, the guide, are helping that along, you know, you're making mini lessons for kids who need mini lessons, but you're only doing that like as needed basis. And, you know, that's where the tools and the techniques fit in is, is that productive struggle stage. And what can happen is, you know, if you think about Luke Skywalker in Star Wars and, you know, the end of that movie is he shoots and he blows up the Death Star and it's fantastic. It's entertaining. However, you know, like we think about our, you know, that's a movie or in other stories are like that. They're all fictional. And in our own math classes, you have to realize that most often students aren't going to be able to hit that proverbial death star or learning objective as clearly and concisely as Luke, you know, met his objective. It's possible that three students in the class do, but at 27 are close. And so what do we do then? And that's where we get to, you know, we can take on actually a hero role a little bit where we ourselves are set up nicely as the guide during that productive struggle to step in and fill in those gaps. Or maybe we have to consolidate the learning at that point to help them meet that goal. And so sometimes what we like to call this, you know, like what happens sometimes is that's like where the lesson happens. It's at the end of the lesson, not say at the beginning of the lesson like the other model. And we really call this like the real flip class. And it has nothing to do with a movie at home or a video watching at home and then coming in and doing math problems in class. This has everything to do with where that lesson might happen and creating that kind of flip in timeline so that at the end you can consolidate, you can fill in gaps, you can see where those kids are. And you would never have been able to see where your students are if you just started the lesson in that, say, traditional kind of way.
So, you know, that's one of our four strategies is, is you want to be more guide than hero and make the kid the hero in the class because that can create the real flip class. And, and what was amazing is that model allows you to do the other three things, the other three strategies. You can't really do the other three strategies unless you take this kind of model as the guide. You know, I'm just putting in the chat box the link for the webinars, the rest of the webinars this weekend as well, simply because uh, it would be amazing if you uh, were coming closer to the consolidation of our webinar. But before that, I want to make sure that if you enjoyed it tonight, it'd be great if you could flip that on whatever channels you have, whether it's to your colleagues, on social media, feel free to tag us in it. That would be great as well. We've had such a great group. It looks like about 120 most of the time here, 115, which is awesome. We'd love to make sure that other people have this experience as well. So let's go ahead and do a quick summary before we start wrapping up and do our last giveaway, our last mm -hmm. giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, so four strategies, we started with avoiding the rush to the algorithm, making sure that we don't do all that pre-teaching, making sure we're giving kids an all access pass. So that's lowering the floor and raising the ceiling. In particular, we looked at the curiosity path just briefly. It's a big idea, but definitely something to you know put on your radar. Number three was to be more prints. So using tools and representations to move from the concrete to the abstract and doing so at every student's individual starting point and to move them just enough to get them down their own journey. And then finally, John wrapped it up for us with being the guide, not the hero. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there is a link there that we're gonna keep on the screen for the next number of slides, so no panic there, but there's going to be all kinds of downloads, including the guides that we had shared out mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. as well as some other opportunities for you to continue some learning. Hey there, Math Moment Makers. Thanks for listening in to our webinar replay from back in January of this year. Throughout the webinar, we referenced guides, printables, and resources that you can download. Head over to the webinar replay page to download these goodies at makemathmoments.com forward slash webinar. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash webinar. Keep an ear out for upcoming webinars from us. We'll be having another one before the school year ends for 2019. If you're interested in more from us, in the meantime, you can watch our four-part video series on making math moments that matter at makemathmoments.com forward slash lesson one. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash lesson one. Or Keep in mind that each fall and spring, we host our online workshop where we empower you to help your students become resilient problem solvers. The fall workshop will open up for registration September 13th, 2019. Join the wait list right now. Be notified over at makemathmoments.com forward slash online workshop. Makemathmoments.com forward slash online workshop. In order to ensure you don't miss out on new episodes as they come out each week, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform by simply searching or by using these quick links. For iTunes, go to makemathmoments.com forward slash iTunes. For Google Play, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash play. For Spotify, go to makemathmoments.com forward slash Spotify. And quick links will work for most other popular podcasting platforms as well. Also, if you're liking what you're hearing, please share the podcast with a colleague and help us reach a wider audience by leaving us a review on iTunes, just like over 40 people have on the Canadian and U.S. iTunes stores. We don't even know how many others are out there right now on all the different country stores, but we are going to be diving in and having a look. Some of you have even been kind enough to leave us reviews on iTunes like this one from the Canadian iTunes store from Sabashi91. 78356. He must love numbers or she must love numbers. I love that. Sabashi so says, so excited to have found this podcast. I've been slowly transforming the way I teach math over the last few years, and I'm continually looking for ways to grow as an educator and to make my math teaching more effective. So much great guidance and information here. Thanks for sharing your journey and knowledge. So go ahead, do us a huge favor and leave us an honest review on iTunes and hit the subscribe button. Show notes and links to resources from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 19. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 19. 
You can also find Make Math Moments on all social media platforms and seek out our free private Facebook group recently named to Math Moment Makers K through 12. Well, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high fives for you.